Hey guys, it's LJEST2004 here, and today we're going to take a look at the full video of Peter Cundall's Guide to Practical Organic Gardening from 1992. Here's the front, spine, no profile picture, and the back. Here's the tape, and let's see the full video. Tell me what you do in your leisure time. Nothing. That's why it's called leisure time. Do a lot of fishing. Easy. Playing golf. Welcome, to, I'm sorry, I, I stepped up too quickly there. The psychiatrists tell me that men, oh, good start, keep it going. Get it right, was a gardening Australian magazine. Here's a plant that's found in most of Australia. No, sorry. You all know where this is. It's the botanical garden. It's the <laughs> Get it right. That's marvellous. That's why it's so healthy. But it's also... <laughs> well, those are very forgiving plants. Sorry. All right, nobody's perfect, but... <laughs> All right, nobody's perfect, but get this month's Gardening Australia magazine and you're on the way. On sale now at news agents and major supermarkets. Oh, why not subscribe? Ring our toll-free number. It's 008 900 and you can have it home delivered. Call now, 008 900 Do you know why people are flocking to places like this? They're coming here to buy organically grown fruit and vegetables. And you know why? It's because we're all concerned about the environment. But we're concerned about what we're eating, and what's in what we're eating, and what might be sprayed onto what we're eating. And that's why organic growing is now one of the most powerful movements on earth. between organic growing and orthodox gardening. Well, it's quite simple. When you grow things organically, you don't use poisons and you don't use harsh chemical fertilizers. In other words, organic growing is nothing more than old-fashioned traditional gardening before toxic substances were introduced. Now, in this video, we're gonna show you how you can grow your own organic fruit and vegetables and ornamental plants. We're gonna show you how to get started, how to lay out your vegetable garden how to balance the soil and whether or not to use lime. We're going to deal with problem soils like clay and extremely sandy soil. We're going to show you how to enrich the soil the most natural way, how to make compost and there are lots of ways. We're going to show you how to grow potatoes under straw, how to grow organic vegetables and fruit, how to control pests and diseases without using any toxic substances, and how to have the most beautiful ornamental garden without poisons. So come on, let's get stuck into it. You couldn't get a more simple layout for a new organic vegetable garden than this. It's quite small. It's only, what, about 14 metres by about 5 metres. And yet it will fit perfectly into most backyards. And in spite of its small size, it can be enormously productive. Let's have a look at it more closely. 
First, the most important ingredient of all, the soil. This is a hungry, impoverished sandy loam. But the aim of organic growing is to constantly increase soil fertility naturally all the time, even while you're cropping. But let's have a look at these individual beds. It took me about three hours to prepare this lot. And you can see the size of the beds. They're two metres wide and about four metres long. And the reason why they're so small is for easy access. In other words, you can rake or work them from the sides because once you've cultivated the soil, you never walk on it again if you can. That's what the paths are for. You'll see I've got a thick layer of sawdust over. That's to keep your boots clean. But the burning question is, why are there four beds? And the answer is quite simple. It's because the garden is based on a four-year rotation system. You see, if you keep planting the same plants in the same spot year after year, you get a build-up of disease and pest organisms in the soil. So, by rotating the plants systematically from bed to bed as the seasons go, you shatter the cycle of growth of diseases and pests, and that means you can achieve good control without poisons. That's how simple it is. So, how does it all work? Well, the first bed is lime, and then in go the legumes. They're the peas and the beans. They're the great replenishers of nitrogen in the soil. And they're followed by the greedy brassicas because they love that nitrogen. That's for the first bed. The second bed, that's for the root crops. They're the carrots and the parsnips and the beetroot, and they'll love those conditions. In the third bed, they're the great companions like sweet corn and pumpkin and zucchini and cucumber. They love each other. And in the fourth bed, that's for the salanum crops. That's tomatoes and capsicum and eggplants. And once the tomatoes have been harvested from the fourth bed, the area is lined and the legumes are brought across from the first bed. And the other three beds, they just move up one and the rotation continues. Well, as you can see, there's a fair amount of cultivation here. Well, I also like the no-dig method. They also call it sheet composting because that's exactly what it is. It's a sheet of organic material, in this case a piece of straw, spread over the surface of the ground. But it could be lawn pudding, wilted weeds, anything, any form of organic matter. It doesn't make any difference. But spread it right over the underground like that. And then roughly level it like that. And now to enrich it. Sheet manure. A magnificent room. Look at that. You see how it weighs it down? What this does, it helps the straw to rot and it makes it turn into compost much more effectively. And put it on thick and generously. And some very old foul manure. This is no longer volatile and it's also been broken down with sawdust. And it's absolutely crammed with nitrogen. That's enough. Now, what about a bit of concentrated cow milk? There's a lovely brew indeed. Very concentrated. You can buy this just about anywhere. Perfect for this job. And of course, your favourite and mine, ladies and gentlemen, blood and bone. A good sprinkling right over the whole lot. Exactly what the soil are. Then. Look at it. Now, all this is marvellous, you might say. But how do you plant the blooming thing? It's dead easy. All you do is make a hole in this mulch, like that, to expose that soil there down below, and then disturb the soil a little bit. See? Mix in a bit that manure too. And in goes a plant, like that. This is a lovely broccoli. And all that lovely drainage is going to feed it, and it's going to grow like mine. Now you can't sow seeds in this lot, because they'll just die. What you do is you create a valley, like that, to expose that soil, there it is. And it's perfect for making a drill. That's easy. With a trowel, there we are. Loosen up the soil all the way along. And all that remains now is to sow the seed. Here they are. Lovely bean seeds. These are bush beans. They're terrific and they adore these conditions. And just simply drop them in the drill like that. All the way along. About four inches apart, and then backfill. And what you do is you make sure that that valley still remains packing until the beans are well up. 
So this is another easy way of growing things organically. And by the way, all these methods are ideal for ornamental plants too. But what have we learned from this lot? Look, it's quite simple. Practice rotation and you can keep your pests and diseases down without chemicals. Go for companion plantings because they do love each other. But above all, have a reverence for the soil. Do that and you're on your way. You can usually tell how fertile soil is by the type of weeds that are growing in it. But you've got a fair idea if you dig down and have a look at it. Look at that there. Now this looks terrific. But what we need to know is the acid alkaline balance, what they call the pH. Now there are all sorts of gadgets for testing the soil. I like this simple cheap testing kit here. It costs about $18 and you can carry out hundreds of soil tests with it. I'll show you how to use it. First of all, take a soil sample from about five centimetres down and place it on this little white plate they supply. Sprinkle it with this kind of dark dye stuff here and mix it into the soil. Then sprinkle with this white powder. You'll notice it immediately starts to change colour. And when it's fully changed, match it up with the chart. There it is. The pH of this is six and a half, and that's just about perfect. But what is pH, and what do these numbers mean? Well, it's a scale that measures the acid-alkaline balance of the soil. Now, if the soil is evenly balanced, it's neutral, and it's pH seven. The more acidic the soil, the lower the number. The more alkaline the soil, the higher the number. And the ideal balance for most gardens is slightly acidic at pH 6.5. Most garden soils are between pH 5 and pH 7.5. But the big question is, what can you do if your soil is unbalanced in some way? Well, if it's alkaline, it's very difficult to make more acidic. You can use old manure, acidic leaves, sawdust and stuff like that all mixed together. That'll bring it down. But if your soil's acidic, it's a lot easier. You can use this stuff here to make it sweeter. This is calcium, it's limestone. But you can hardly throw great lumps of limestone around the garden. That'd do absolutely nothing. What they do, they grind it up. And they get this stuff, ground limestone. You can get that at any nursery, no problem at all. And it's wonderful for sweetening the soil. But occasionally, they find magnesium in the limestone and they get this. Here it is. This is magnesium limestone. It's also known as dolomite. And it's wonderful because it contains magnesium and calcium. But the two of them, they've got one snag. They're extremely slow to act. So they have to treat this limestone in a very special way. And what they do, they get great lumps of it like this and they put them in a kiln and they heat it to a red heat and then they allow it to cool down. And this process causes a remarkable transformation to take place. The whole character of the limestone changes and it becomes this stuff here. Highly volatile, you handle it with gloves. This is quicklime. You rarely see it these days because it's so difficult to handle. So what they do, they water it or they slake it. And by wetting it, it causes it immediately to heat up and start to steam. And then it starts to erupt and swell and flake and it looks quite extraordinary but it's totally changing its character again and eventually when it's cooled down it's become this stuff here what we call hydrated or slaked lime and this is the common fine white silky lime that you buy in most garden shops that's reasonably volatile but you never use it with manures or any nitrogenous fertilizers but in some gardens especially those with sandy soil there's one significant mineral deficiency, and it shows up in the way plants grow and the shape of them, and that's potash. Look at this plant here. This is a silver bee, but can you see how curiously squat looking it is? In fact, the leaves, instead of being long, they're almost round. So you get this little plant with leaves that are also extremely soft and highly susceptible to diseases. This is a wonderful example of potassium deficiency in hungry soil. Compare it with this other silver beet plant here, which is growing quite normally. Here the leaves are tougher, they're more healthy, and they're certainly hardier and less susceptible to diseases. 
So what's the answer? Well, one way is to use this stuff here. You see the small amount I have? Now this is sulfate of potash. And even a tiny amount like this is sufficient to supply the needs of most plants. Now, if you're an absolute organic purist, and I'm not, you wouldn't use sulfate of potash. You'd use other sources for potassium. You'd use ash and burnt seaweed and crushed rock. And you'd also use this, the greatest of all fertilizers, compost. The compost that's been made with a wide variety of ingredients, including seaweed and chicken manure. Do this, and you've really got it the organic way. <laughs> The great joy of extremely sandy soil, it's absolutely heaven to dig. But there's one big problem. You see, this easily dug soil is nothing more than dirty sand. It doesn't contain much. Listen to it. Can you hear how gritty and how coarse it is? You know what that means? It means that when the rain comes down or water passes through, it does so quite fast and it takes with it any of the minerals that are highly soluble, like potash and nitrogen and iron and many others. In other words, this lovely sandy soil is usually very impoverished indeed. It's also very shallow soil. Look at that profile there, see? Now you can see why I was digging it like that before and not turning it over, because you don't bring up rubbish like this at all. What you do with this type of soil is, once it's been dug, you never dig it again. However, what's the best way of dealing with the problem of really sandy soil? Well, for a start, when you put in a plant, put some of this stuff in the hole first. It's compost. That'll give the plant a really good start anyway, right from the very beginning. And then the next stage is to mulch. You use a feeding mulch, any kind of mulching material, Grass clippings, leaves, the lot, and lots of manure on too. That means all the lovely goodness drips down into the soil all the time. And you never ever dig it in, it's most important. But there's one magic secret ingredient and it'll amaze you. And this is it. That's right, it's nothing more than hard, horrible, sticky clay. And yet this is the one ingredient that's lacking in sandy soil. Sandy soil contains virtually no clay at all. But you can hardly start chopping this sort of thing up and try to mix it into the sandy soil. That's virtually impossible. No, there's a special, simple way of doing it. You can see what I've done. I've dropped a great lump of clay into this water here and it's been slowly collapsing over the last couple of days. Look at that. But the thing is that clay contains most of the minerals that are lacking in sandy soil. So all that remains now is to dribble this revolting brew around the plants. They'll love it. So there you are. If you have a really impoverished sandy soil, there's always a lovely, slightly revolting organic solution. Now listen, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, oh, all oh, this is fine. But what about us with our clay soil? Well, you couldn't get much worse clay than this stuff here. Look at that. Isn't that an absolute nightmare? And clay is the exact opposite of sandy soil. This is smooth and almost buttery. And the thing is, it's absolutely crammed with minerals, unlike sandy soil. The snag is that the plant can't get in there to get at them, so it's a real problem. But there's a wonderful way of dealing with it. And it's this stuff here. It's gypsum. It's a form of calcium or alabaster. And it's quite remarkable. In fact, they call it clay breaker, because that's precisely what it does. When you put it on the clay, like that, and put it on quite thickly and generously, really throw the stuff around like that, and then dig it in. It's wonderful. It'll break up the heaviest clay in the most remarkable way. And it doesn't make the soil more alkaline or more acidic. It's terrific, but there are other ways too. And they could be a lot cheaper. But there are few substances that are cheaper than this. It's sawdust. But if you dug this directly into the ground, you'd be start raving mad because sawdust contains virtually no nitrogen. 
The only way you can use it to break up the soil is by adding nitrogen as manure or blood and bone, like this here. Lots of it. And great shovelfuls of foul manure too. Mix it well in. And sheep manure as well. So you get a lovely nitrogen rich brew like that, a wonderful one. And that lovely lot can be shoveled directly over the clay soil and dug in. And it's absolutely wonderful. In no time at all, you'll be able to grow anything and the soil will be easy to work. That's organic growing. Organic growers are absolutely obsessed by the soil. But how can you improve soil fertility and enrich it without chemicals? And the answer is a whole range of different types of manures and their manners. Look at this lot here. This is sheep manure. It's come from underneath the shearing sheds. And it's absolutely full of nutrients, but it's mainly organic matter too. And you see these little carrots here. Look, leave those on the surface and you'll still be playing marbles with them in about six months' time. So dig it all in or cover it with straw. Cow manure is virtually the same. But when it's left out in the paddock, the rain leaches out most of the nutrients. But when these cow packs are pulverised, they make the most fantastic soil conditioner. And it's the same with horse manure that's been left in the paddock. You can see how this has been completely leached of nutrients. But it's wonderful when it's dug in. When you get manure like this, horse manure in particular, that's been collected under cover or fresh, you've got to be very careful about it. Let it lose its volatility first, and then it's fantastic. But I suppose the most easily available of all the manures is undoubtedly stable manure. This stuff here, and you can see why it's good. It's full of straw and urine as well as the manure too. But it can be highly volatile, so use it with great care or leave it to mature. Best of all, use it as a mulch. But of all the different types of animal manure, this is the most valuable. It's poultry manure. And it's absolutely crammed with nitrogen and potassium. It's a wonderful brew. But there's one big snag. It's what they call hot. It's highly volatile, and that's because it contains very little organic matter. So use it with very great care and allow it to rot fully first. And you can even bulk it out with sawdust or any other form of organic matter, and then it can be used successfully in any part of the garden. And now the fertilizer I'm always raving about. You know what it is. It's blood and bone. And do you know why it's so good? Because the bone meal contains calcium and phosphorus. And the blood meal, that contains slow-release nitrogen. But there's one thing lacking. It's this stuff here. It's potash. And that's why whenever I use blood and bone, I always add about 10% potash and mix it in. And what do you get? A wonderful balanced fertilizer that will enrich the soil just about anywhere. Now listen, if you want to bring along those leafy vegetables like cabbages and lettuce, this is the one to get them really shifted. A bag of manure in lots and lots of water, soaking for about three weeks, and isn't that the most gorgeous brew you've ever seen in all your life? Liquid manure. Dilute it with lots and lots of water, and then dribble it around your plants and stand back. But the greatest fertilizer of all, and the most natural, is the one you can make yourself. Guess what it is? There it is. It's compost. It's magnificent. It's brimming with living things. It's full of moles and different types of fungi, and it's balanced, and it's very gentle, even around the most tender and sensitive plants. Use it with great care, because it's precious. But there's one kind of manure that's completely different, and that's the one that we sow and we grow. And it grows into a lovely, lush crop. And then, when it's about knee-high, we dig it in. And that's green manure. And that's the great soil enricher. What kind of seeds are best for green manure? Well, this is Rycon. You've just seen me sowing it. It's an annual. It's a grass. It grows extremely lush. It loves the cold and thrives in the winter. And when it's dug in, it adds massive bulk to the ground. It's beautiful. Also, a cold rubber are the tick beans. This is a lead bean. It's like a kind of a broad bean. It grows extremely vigorously, and being a lead bean, it literally pumps the nitrogen into the soil. This is a wonderful green manure crop, especially for cold districts. But if you live in warmer areas, look, you can even use sorghum. As long as you remember to dig it in when it's about knee high. 
this loves the dry conditions too. And again, for the tropics, or for anywhere else for that matter, sunflower seed. Honestly, this absolutely thrives, again, when you dig it in, when it's about knee-high. A wonderful crop on a wonderful green manure all the year round in the tropics. And all you do is just roughly rake that seed in, just enough to dirty it. And it'll be up, and it'll grow like that. So you don't need harsh, chemical, disruptive fertilizers in your soil. You can use manures, and blood and bone, and green manure. And that's the organic way. Isn't this a marvellous pumpkin patch? Look, there are pumpkins everywhere and they're magnificent. But you know why they've succeeded? Because they've been grown with the greatest of all fertilisers and that's compost. But let's dispel a myth straight away. Compost isn't just nothing more than garden debris that's been allowed to rot down. That's not compost, it's not bad, but it's full of weed seeds. No, compost is made in a special way. One day, you're going to look around and find enough of these piles of debris lying around to be able to say, I'm going to make some compost at last. Look at that lovely bridge. Now, what I've done, I've managed to acquire this delicious pea straw. Isn't it fantastic? I've wet it, and I'm going to make it as the basis of a freestanding heap, and it's dead easy. The secret of getting a compost heap to heat up is to have lots of room. In other words, you put it right on the soil for a start and have the base of it at least one and a half metres by one and a half metres. So they're big. If it's any smaller, it won't get hot. It hasn't got the bulk. And you can make it into a neat square like that, but just put the stuff down, the basic material, whether it's straw or whatever, to a depth of about 200 millimetres. That's about eight inches. But the greater the number of ingredients, the better the compost. Look at that. These are grass clippings and vegetable waste. And look at this stuff here. Seaweed. Absolutely marvellous to be. It's absolutely crammed with trace elements. And compost loves it. Remember that anything that once lived can live again in a compost heap. This is natural fibre, it's cotton. They're fantastic, they'll soon knock down. Old nappies, they'll really get it going. And people worry about newspapers. Look, they're very good for the compost heap, but get rid of any with coloured print. And the stuff, I've already wet this, I tear it up like that. It breaks down much more effectively. And you can put that in the heap and just bury it in there so it won't blow around. It'll soon be buried completely anyway. Like that there. Okay. But this little lot's not going to rot down very quickly or even get hot. It needs fuel. And the best fuel of all is animal manure containing plenty of nitrogen. This is sheep manure. A thin layer over the surface like that. That's marvellous. But there's one that's even better. And that's poultry manure. That's full of nitrogen. A good dollop of this, right over the heap, and I can feel it starting to flob slightly already. I'm going to put some pepper and salt into this nutritious pie. Look at this. Lovely chicken pellets, aren't they beautiful? That's marvellous. But there's more. Yes, you've guessed it. It's inevitable. Blood and bone. Look at that. Beautiful, isn't it? That's absolutely crammed with nitrogen. But there's one more. This stuff here. My God, it stinks. It's fish meal. It's got the most revolting smell. But compost feet, they love it. And now the most important ingredient of all, the water. It is absolutely essential. And what you do, you literally saturate the whole thing. And you do that at every stage. From now on, it's nothing more than a repeat of the same process. A layer of the basic raw materials, then seaweed, then the manures, then the fertilisers, and always a good saturating watering. It's so important. And just keep building up the heap, adding the different layers. And eventually, when it's big enough, or when you've exhausted the materials, you'll finish up with what looks like a magnificent chocolate layer cake, but infinitely more nutritious. Now, even if this heap was left completely undisturbed, it would still heat up quite dramatically in three or four days, and then gradually cool down. Within what, one, two or three months, you'd have a wonderful core of superb compost. 
But if you wanted to hasten the process, all you do is pull this whole heap apart every three days, keeping it watered, and form another heap all the time. And that means that the whole lot can be converted into compost in less than a month if you want to. Now, if you think, oh, this is a bit hard, and it's not really, you can obtain one of these lidded compost bins. They come in all shapes and sizes, and honestly, they're absolutely fantastic. Look at this here. You can use not only your kitchen scraps, but also your tea and coffee grains. Keep them watered, and you can see how full that is there. Look, the method of decomposition is much different than the open heap. And what it will do, it will rot down very rapidly indeed, so much so that it's almost impossible to keep them full. They have a very good, tight, dry-proof lid. There it is. And in fact, the rats can, mice can't get in the bottom because of the sheer weight of the whole thing. But there's even more significant methods of making compost. This is the wonderful compost tumbler. They cost about 400 bucks and they're worth every cent. They're absolutely marvellous. All you do is you put in your kitchen scraps, a bit of water, your grass clippings, and every, what, every day you turn them around like this a few times, about five times. At the end of two weeks, open up the hatch, it comes off quite freely, give it a complete turn, like that, and out drops this gorgeous brew ready for the garden. Isn't it lovely? And finally, you can't get past the good old side support to compost bin. They don't have to be so large. In fact, if they're small, they can still retain the heat because of the supporting size. But no matter which method of making compost that you use, you still get this fantastic stuff. There it is, compost, the greatest of all fertilizers. It's so good you can put it on your muesli in the morning. Here they are, the good old spuds the most widely grown and the most popular of all food crops on a world scale. And you know why they're so popular? Because there's more energy per square metre produced when you grow potatoes than any other food crop. I'm going to show you how to grow them under straw. It's a different way. But irrespective of which way you use to grow your sponge, there's one thing you must remember. Use certified seed potatoes like these. You see how small they are? And that means you won't have any disease problems. And all you do is simply place them out. Now you'll notice that the ground hasn't been dug and it's full of weeds. But it doesn't matter. All you do is place out the seed potatoes about 30 centimetres apart and half a metre apart. And it's true, they look a little bit silly, but this is the way you do it. Now, what about the ingredients to go over the top? Dead easy. For a start, straw. Any kind of straw. This is pea straw. But any old hay will do. Manure. It doesn't matter what kind of manure you use. Horse manure, sheep manure. This is sheep manure with a bit of chicken manure as well. But there's more. Look at this. Sawdust. This helps to keep the light out and it's most important. And also, you've guessed it. Blood and bone, there it is, your favourite and mine, and some concentrated cow manure too. Look, it's going to make the most marvellous brew. So let's get it on. First of all, the straw, and put it thickly, at least half a metre thick, and it's a lot, I know. Then weigh it down with the manure, scattered right over the surface. Any kind of manure. Then the sawdust, don't forget that helps to keep the light out. And be generous with it too. And to counter any nitrogen problem, that's where the blood and bone and the camel can go in, over the surface. And finally, a great big deep, absolutely soaking watering. It needs it. In about three weeks, the potato tops will be popping up all over the place. And if this lot starts to settle down and might let the light in, you'll add more straw. That stops the potato from going green and poisonous. But do it right, and you'll get the finest crop of spuds that you've ever tasted. Well, as you can see, I've already been at work preparing to sow and plant the organic vegetable garden. This is the first bed, and in many ways, it's the most important bed. And you know why? This is where the legumes are to go. They're the great replenishers of nitrogen in the soil. 
The whole bed's been limed and dolomited, it's been fertilized and watered, and I'm ready to sow the seed. And this is the best way I know of growing peas organically and obtaining magnificent yields. You can see what I've done here. I've prepared a trench and I've lined it with wet newsprint. And the reason for this is to slow down the loss of moisture through soakings. And on top of the newsprint is old straw and manure and potash and dolomite and compost and a lovely reserve of food for the roots of the peas as they come through. All that remains now is to backfill. That's dead easy. Just simply push the topsoil directly over the straw, covering it completely with about 10 centimetres, that's four inches of soil. And then just stroke it to finish it off and it's ready for sowing the seed. Now when you make the drill, go down about four to five centimetres, but make it a wide drill. There you are. It's hard to believe now that there's a great reserve of food waiting there for the peas down below. Now, peas and beans, they need phosphorus. And if you're an organic purist, you can't use the superphosphates. But you can use this stuff. It's nothing more than compost that's been made with lots of chicken manure. It also contains lots of potash, and it's just the thing to line the drill. This is a more natural form of phosphorus, and when it's lining a drill like this, it means the pea seed can go directly into it, and then they can take up the phosphorus as they need it. And the kind of seed, I'm going to use green peas, probably one of the most prolific and I think among the most delicious peas you can grow, and now to sow them. Now when you drop them in, scatter them fairly loosely over the whole width of the drill like that. That makes them self-supporting and quite prolific. And all that remains now is to backfill and press the soil directly into contact. And now a row of bush beans. Exactly the same, straight into this compost like this. And these two, after backfilling, will be up in a matter of days. But don't forget to plant them in the warm weather. Now you're probably wondering what this structure's for. Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? This is for the climbing beans. And in fact, I've put a trench in, as with the peas, all the way around here too. But what kind of beans? Well, it depends where you live. If you live in a cool district, why not the lovely scarlet runners? Just simply put them in, about a couple of inches apart, three at the base of every pole, like that, and cover them over. And if you live in a warmer area, one at the beautiful blue lake. There they are, little white beans, but superb pods, and they crop like mad. There they are, just push them in, just like that, and what are you going to get? I can tell you. You're going to get a wall of beans, and you'll be picking them non-stop right away throughout the summer. So, that's the legume bed done. And in fact, as they're harvested here, in go the brassicas to feed off all that lovely nitrogen. That's a lovely form of companion planting. Now for bed two, the root crops, and the most significant of the root crops are the carrots. These are the ones I like best. They're the lovely, juicy, stump-rooted King Chantenay. They're beautiful ones and they'll grow all the year round in most areas. What I've done, I've already put the seed and I've mixed it with sand like this to bulk it out, to space out the seeds. A good shake and then simply dribble it in to the prepared drill like that. See? See how easily it goes in. This saves handling and it also spaces out the individual seedlings too. And from then on, just press into contact like that and believe it or not, the whole lot are up in less than two weeks. Now, the great companions of the carrots are these, the onions. And there's no doubt about it when you get lovely seedlings like this. They're so easy to plant. All you do is just put them straight down there, lying on their sides, in a kind of a trenchy sort of a drill. See how easy it's done? And you can do this virtually at a walking pace, right along there, right to the very end of the drill. And to backfill, it's so easy with a rake. Just simply cover the roots over, that's all, leaving them lying flat. And believe it or not, they're all standing up in about three weeks. And do you know why carrots and onions are such good companions? It's because they don't compete with each other. They can live alongside each other, but the carrots, they keep growing down, whereas the onion tends to thrust itself up onto the surface of the soil. So they help each other. The smell of the onion foliage puts off any pests that might approach the carrots. Now, if you're going to grow parsnips, make sure you use absolutely fresh seed. This is what it looks like. There it is. It's flat and light, but it's sown in exactly the same way as carrots. In fact, I've already got a row in now. Beetroot are magnificent, and they're so easy to sow. Just drop them in like that. These are Derwent Globe. Here they are. 
juicy, delicious, you can cook them or eat them raw, or if you like, do as I do and have them pickled. They are beautiful. And once you've got the seed in, it's no problem to back fill like that with your fingers. Dead easy, right to the end of the drill. Do you know which are the easiest of all the vegetables to grow? These here, the leeks, these are musselberg, and they're so easy to plant, because all you do is you get the seedlings and simply drop them like that into prepared holes just big enough to accommodate each seedling. And there's another job you can do virtually at a walking pace, right to the end. And there you are, a little bit of water to wash the soil around the roots and the job's done. And what have we got? We've got two beds in, in record time. There's absolutely no poisons or chemicals used. And what does it prove? Keep it organic and you can't go wrong. Well, the first two beds have been sold and planted, and now for bed three. And this is the one for the greediest of all the crops, the sweet corn and the pumpkins and all that tribe. These are the great companions. And you can see I've already started to feed the soil. It's absolutely crammed with goodies, sheep manure, poultry manure, compost. In fact, the whole lot of it is already starting to vibrate with life. And now I'll give the soil a special treat. Blood and bone. Wonderful stuff. It contains slow-release nitrogen and phosphorus and calcium too. The soil loves it. And because I'm in a good mood, some dolomite. It contains magnesium and calcium. And the plants absolutely love it. Now to rake it all in, just into the surface, so it mixes in with the sheep and the poultry manure and all the other stuff too. And you can see the whole bed starting to change colour. Let the sowing begin. You know what I'm going to put in here at this end of the bed? Sweet corn. And do you know why here? Because sweet corn will grow to over two metres tall. That casts a big shadow, but the shadow will be across the path. That means that the other plants won't be in the shade. It's a simple matter to make a drill, although it helps if it's a nice straight line. And just make a good, deep, generous groove like that, see? Right the way through there. And it's ready for the seed. And here's the seed here. It's big stuff. Look how big it is, and rather ugly. And all you do is drop it in like that. And if it's a little bit close, don't worry about it. Because you can always use the fillings for another row later on as they come up. And go right to the end. And by the way, this variety is called Snow Sweet. And it's magnificent. And all you do then is backfill. Like that. Sweet corn is planted in a block, not a single row, because it helps pollination that way. I've already put in the second row, and the rows of sweet corn are about a metre apart. And as for all this waste space in between, why well, not take advantage of it? I've planted brown mignonette lettuces, which means they're going to be up, cut and eaten long before the sweet corn has gone away. And now for the plants that love to grow alongside sweet corn. The great companions, pumpkins and swash. And you can see what I've done. I've already prepared four lovely planting mounds. They're lovely and moist, and they're absolutely crammed with organic matter. Look at that there. Perfect for the bush type pumpkin. There they are. The ones that they call golden nugget. There's the seed. See? Like that there. And all you do is you put three per mound. So put it in like that. Another one over here and another one just round the back there. And now for the other man. That can cut three more. There it is, one, two, three. They'll love it. And over here, why not some lovely black jack zucchinis in this man here? There they are. Please, plenty. That'll keep you going for decades. In fact, you've got to watch it. You'll have zeppelins everywhere. There they are. Just push them straight in like that. Another one on the other side there. And the third one here, that's plenty. And over here, what about this wonderful button-type squash? You know, these are absolutely delicious. So easy to grow. The seed, a bit smaller, see? There they are, little tiny seeds there. Exactly the same, only we'll put four. Why not? One there, one over here, one at the back, and one in that nice juicy part there, and they'll just take over. And there's still room for more. And now what about bed four? Well look, the sun's been absolutely pouring into this side here. It's lovely and warm. I want to seal in that heat. So I'm going to use a form of sheet composting. 
I've already mixed into the straw different types of manures and bloody mud, and all that remains is to spread it thickly over the entire bed, about 10 centimetres deep, covering one end to the other. Now, this is the kind of tomato plant you get. Little, short, sturdy ones. And this one's already been triggered off into flowering, which means it's going to go straight into fruit production. And to plant, it's so easy. Just simply part the moss, expose the soil, dig a little hole like that, and in goes the tomato plant. But look at the way I handle it. See, I don't touch that stem at all. Straight into the ground, like that. Tuck it in, and now a lovely mulch of fish manure and pulverised bark, and it's on its way. Now there's enough room in the top of this bed to hold six good-sized tomato plants. That will provide enough tomatoes right the way throughout the summer and autumn for most families. The capsicums are grown in exactly the same conditions as tomatoes. The only difference is they love the warmth, so they go in a little bit later. And this is the Solanum bed virtually completed with tomatoes, capsicums and still room for eggplants. Over here you've got your sweet corn, your zucchinis and pumpkins, root crops and legumes. In other words, the organic garden is on its way. And remember this, at the end of the season the soil must be even more fertile. That's real organic growing. <laughs> When you bring a new fruit tree home for the very first time, don't be impressed with its long and lanky. This is the part you look at first, the root system, and particularly that fibrous stuff down there. That's the part that matters. As for these long, tough brown roots, they can be cut back, especially if they've been damaged in any way, like this one has here, like that. So cut it off and cut them short like that. See, they're not really necessary. Cut them like that. And the plant is ready to go in the hole. Now, remember this, a newly planted fruit tree is going to be in the ground for a very long time, so it's worth making very special preparations to the planting hole. Look what I've done here. It's not just soil in the hole, but it's filled with compost and blood and bone and sheep manure, and in fact the whole thing is absolutely crammed with organic matter. It's going to be like a gigantic sponge and it'll hold moisture beautifully, and that'll carry the tree right through that crucial first summer. But to plant the tree and its gloves off, there it is, put it straight in like that, there. And when you tie it, do so, not tightly, but loosely, just enough to hold it kind of firm there like that, see? And then to backfill, and it's very easy indeed. And you'll notice that the backfilling soil too is also crammed with organic matter too. See, straight over the roots like that. And every now and then, give the tree a bit of a shake. That filters the soil down through the roots. And then again, like that, see? There it is. Right to the top of the hole, and this soil is lovely and moist, heavily laced with wonderful nutrients, and above all, organic matter. Because after all, this is the organic way. And again, a final shake, and it's ready for the last stage. And there's one vitally important job remaining. Any deciduous fruit tree, and this is an apple, they must be pruned at planting time. Right down here, usually about a quarter of the way up, like that, to an outside pointing bud, like that, just above it, to another outside bud here, there it is, and a third one over here, like that, and all you do now is stand back. Fruit trees are beautiful when they're in full bloom, aren't they? But at this crucial time, they've got a major problem, and it's down here. When you get grass and weeds thick like this, they can stunt even the biggest tree because they're so competitive. But the solution is wonderful, and it'll amaze you. When you're on top of weeds, you must be joking. No, I'm not. I'm going to put some blood and bone over, too. But over the top of that, great thick layers of wet newsprint. Lots of it overlapping, too. And then on top of that, more manure and blood and bone. What have you got? You've got a kind of a glorious, gruesome sandwich, but it's very nutritious. This is stage one. What happens is the newsprint, being so thick, it will smother the weeds. But the role of the manure is to rot the newsprint. But by the time the newsprint is fully rotted, the weeds are dead. But there's one side. The newspaper will blow around all over the place unless something's done about it. That's where the straw comes in. This is the next important stage. The straw plays a double role. 
It not only holds the nutrients down, it's stopping it from blowing away, but it also rots and adds to the mulch and therefore feeds the soil around the tree. What's going to happen now? Well, I said you'd be amazed. For a start, the straw and the manures, they're going to rot down and they're going to feed the soil. But most important of all, newsprint, this terrible waste material, is now being recycled back into the soil. And surely, recycling is the very essence of organic growth. This is a simple but extremely effective bird scare and it costs nothing. Do you know why? All it is is two drink cans jammed together in a special kind of a way. But what a wonderful example it is of the kind of so-called waste products that can be recycled to protect our plants and our fruit. But that's what organic growing is all about. It's about recycling and avoiding toxic substances. But people say, hang on, how can you control pests and diseases without poisons? Well, you can. Let's start by making one of these. All you do is cut the top from two drink cans and make a hole in the base of each. With a pair of kitchen snips, cut one side into strips, but not right to the end. Then, open the strips out like a daisy and give each strip a half turn. Now put some wire through it and give the other can a just a couple of snips. Insert the wire, then jam the two together, like that. Now bend the wire on the outside, like that, and insert it into a hole drilled into a garden stem. It works beautifully. I reckon snails are horrible. They destroy our plants and they do enormous damage. Now the organic way is quite simple. You go out after a heavy rain, especially in the evening, and do a kind of a grotesque dance. Don't forget to sluice your gum boots afterwards, but you can really wipe them out by the thousands. But if you're going to use snail pellets, like these here, look, be very careful because pets will eat them and they'll kill them. What you do is use something like this here. It's nothing more than a piece of rigid plastic tube, but snails love to get in there. They love it. So what we can do, we can lay a trap. Place it where the snails have been doing the damage and then secure it with a couple of pieces of bent fencing wire, like that. That prevents any of the animals disturbing it. And then, get your snail bait and put it into a small container, like that, see? Just a small amount, just enough to tent, see? And place it in one end of the tube, like that, putting it in, out of reach of the pet, but within reach of the snails. They'll come in there after it, and it'll knock them off by the dozen. Of all the ornamental plants, I imagine roses would be the most popular of all, but occasionally there can be problems. Do you know what this is here? This is the dreaded black spot disease of roses. It will completely defoliate your plant, but it's spread by rain splash or by water splash. In other words, if you avoided using sprinklers and used drip irrigation, and that's very effective, you're already on the way to controlling it. This question of hygiene is vitally important for disease control in the garden, but especially in the orchard. Have you ever seen anything like these before? These are mummified peaches and they indicate that the whole tree was badly infected with brown rot disease last summer. In fact, the fruit went rotten just at that crucial time. Now the disease has harbored over in these during the winter, and they must be cut off completely and destroyed. Another very effective and safe way of controlling brown rot of stone fruit is by using a wonderful old-fashioned fungicide called Bordeaux mixture. And it's a beauty and you can make it yourself. All you have to do is mix 50 grams of this stuff here into half a bucket of hot water. This is copper sulfate. There it is. Just mix it straight in like that and stir it up and you can see how the water starts to go blue. Now make sure it's a plastic bucket, it's most important. Now, in a separate bucket completely, and it doesn't have to be hot water, Mix in 50 grams of this stuff here. This is hydrated lime, 
This is the fine white stuff. And mix it straight in like that there. It dissolves quite well. And you make what they call milk of lime. It's actually going white, see, like me. And now for the final mixing. You pour the lime mix into the copper mix and not the other way around. And you do it slowly like that. And watch it change. It forms what they call a flocculated glue. See that there? That is Bordeaux mixture. It's a strong mix. And it's applied to trees when they're not in leaf, before they're in leaf. And it's also good for black spot of roses and leaf curl of peach and nectar trees. That's Bordeaux. One of the most appalling pests which plague apple trees is the codling moth grub. This is a typical old-fashioned codling moth trap, and the way it works is quite simple. When the grub itself has eaten its way out of the apple, it looks for somewhere to hide. That's after it's done the damage. That's why we put these there in the spring. They must be removed every month to clean them out and in fact replace them completely, right away until March. That means that gradually, over time, the whole of the codling moth population around the tree is reduced quite markedly, and you get a balance. And so pest and disease control in the final analysis is nothing more than balance. When people talk about organic growing, they usually refer to the vegetable or the fruit garden. But it also means the lawn and the other part of the ornamental garden too. In fact, just about everything that grows can be grown organically. Look at that awful little weed there. It even works. You know what I've done and done? I've killed him, really. This is the old-fashioned lawn stand. What will happen that in about a week, that weed there, that flat weed, will go black, whereas the grass around will continue to grow. This is the stuff here, see? Old-fashioned lawn sand. I'll show you how to mix it. All you do is you get good quality dry sand. Now this is river sand or pit sand, but it's not sea sand, it's most important. And into that, you put about a quarter of sulfate of ammonia. There it is. That's enough there. Mix it up. That's how simple it is. What have you got? That is lawn sand. It kills flat weeds in lawns and there's no danger of spraying it. Now don't forget, the ornamentals too love to be fed in the most natural way. They too thrive on organic fertilizers. They love the stuff. Look at these beautiful camellias. But they're growing in impoverished soils. Here's a lovely reticulata camellia. But it's already losing a little bit of vigor because it's lost the pea. I've got just the thing for it. Here it is, and it's wonderful. This is the perfect camellia mix, and it's so natural. It's compost and it's mixed up with sheep manure. And there's a little bit of blood and bone too, and a very small amount of potash. There it is, isn't that wonderful? And when you feed a camellia, you do it about once a year, usually in the spring. And to do it, it's so simple. Watch this lot, straight over the surface, directly over the root zone, like that, see? And then spread it around, like that. Now one vital thing, see this stem here, keep it absolutely clear about that, because if this manure gets in contact with the stem for long periods, it'll send it mouldy, so keep it well back. You know which is the best of all the organic fertilizers for long? It's blood and bone. It's wonderful stuff. But there's one snag when you put it on grass. It can actually burn the grass, and that's why it's very important to water the lawn thoroughly before you apply the blood and bone. Then put it on. Here it is, and it's a wonderful brew. Look at that there. When you put it on, spread it at the rate of a good fistful for every square metre. Can you see it there falling over the grass? Now it's important that you know that because it will burn unless it's washed on afterwards. But the wonderful thing about blood and bone, it's slow release. That means it penetrates right down to the base of the lawn itself, and the grass roots follow it down. That gives you a drought resistant one. And now the next stage is to wash off that blood and bone. Straight down between the blades of the grass, like that, see? So it's all being washed in. Now it means you're going to have the most magnificent sward, very slowly and very gently, and above all, very, very organically. Some of our ornamental plants are desperately and continuously trying to tell us when there's something wrong. Look at this rhododendron, for example. It's desperately short of minerals and it's telling us through its leaves. Look at those. In fact, it's short of just about the lot because the soil here is impoverished. 
But the major shortage, as you can see there, is iron. The plant itself is sick for lack of mineral, and I've got just the medicine from it, and it's very organic. This isn't manure in here, it's compost. And you see that dribbly looking stuff coming out there, that weak stuff? That's compost tea. It's wonderful, it bounds, and it's very, very natural and organic. But it needs a supplement in this case. And this is the supplement. It's iron, but iron of a special kind. This is what they call chelated iron. There it is, it looks like mustard, doesn't it? And all you do is put a small amount like that in there, and it dissolves almost straight away, and stir it up. What have we got? We've got a beautiful, balanced, all your feed. And all that's necessary now is to spray it directly onto the foliage like that. And believe it or not, the plant takes it in almost straight away. It will absolutely love it. And from now on, this plant will gradually recover with a couple more feeds like this. And it will be completely transformed in a matter of months. There are a few things more beautiful or satisfying or safe than an organic ornamental garden. So keep clear of the chemicals and certainly avoid the poisons and honestly, you're on your way, organically. So there you are, you can see how simple and practical it all is. And like me, you'll become totally addicted and it's marvellous. And if you want to know more about all aspects of organic gardening or any other type of gardening, don't forget the ABC's Gardening Australia programme. And there's our Gardening Australia magazine too. It's out every month, so don't miss it. I'll see you soon. Garden Indoors with Gardening Australia's Houseplants video. Join Jane Edmondson as she takes you through the wondrous world of indoor plants. From cyclamen to coleus, there's a plant for every situation. Maintenance, troubleshooting, the interesting and unusual, as well as the beautiful. Just call 008 800 933 for the simple steps to successful houseplants. Enhance the beauty of your home. Ring now, 008 800 Nine double three. And there you have it everyone, that was the full video of Peter Cundall's Practical Organic Gardening from 1992. And I hope you had fun watching this video as much as I have. So, do you like all my content? Please make sure to comment, subscribe and smash that like button. And after you've done it, you'll be notified when a new video is on my channel. So I'll see you guys later.